Welcome everybody to PT on Ice. This is Eric Chaconis. Today I'm going to talk a little bit about lateral hip tendon injury, tendon pain, and how we can and progress uh, this type of an injury from an exercise standpoint. This kind of comes from, I took a course with uh, a diagnostic ultrasound course at, at Gulf Coast Ultrasound Institute about a month ago. I cannot say enough about that course and that group. I learned so much. Hey, Kelsey, how are you doing? Um, it, John Jacobson, most notably one of the lead radiologists that taught that course, really kind of opened my eyes to some things that I, that I had, uh, in, in some cases, never really heard of and, and some things that really just um, were interesting. So one of them was, so here you've got a radiologist, a musculoskeletal specialist, who, um, who, see, who is an interventional radiologist with 30 years of experience. And one of the things that he said when he was going over the hip pathology section was, you know, rarely when I scan someone's hip, do I ever actually see uh, a swollen bursa. In fact, the majority of the time, the vast majority of the time, there's, there's no swelling or no inflammation in the bursal region at all. And it's actually a hip uh, tendon injury, tendon tendinosis is what he called it. And so there's some type of structural change to the glute med or glute min tendon as they come down towards the lateral uh, greater trochanter. And I think that's something that I've heard of before and I've read some stuff on these recalcitrant uh, tendon injuries and tendon tears that seem like they could be greater trochanteric bursitis, but in fact they are not. So anyway, I think we, we might need a little bit of a paradigm shift when we look at lateral hip pain kind of getting away from the idea that the bursa may be swollen and, and more into sort of how, how can we load these tendons to stimulate healing to get the person stronger and desensitize that tissue a little bit. So that's what I'm going to talk about here today is just show you some examples of kind of how to progress uh, loading for those tissues there at the lateral hip. And one of it is, is a mindset shift of looking at the hip almost just like the rotator cuff in a lot of ways. And right, so like this hip, hip musculature sort of like the rotator cuff of the shoulder and we're going to progress it in a similar fashion. So one of the keys when we look at these soft tissue injuries and uh, tendon stuff is, you know, how can we, when it's highly irritable, how can we create a window of opportunity? I'm sure you guys have heard me say that before. I want to create a window of opportunity, a hypoalgesic effect so that I can initiate some type of loading program. And that could be through a number of different methods. In my case, typically it's manual therapy to just, Try to get that joint feeling a little better, reduce the pain, and then start our initiation. So um, it could be a number of techniques. If the hip is stiff, then maybe there is a role for some type of passive mobility work. Try to get them kind of moving a little bit freer, and then we're going to get into some of these specific exercises. So really low-level stuff. In, in most cases, when you're looking at this type of lateral hip pain, you know, it's in my experience and what I'm seeing in my patient populations, typically uh, female age 50, 60, you know, e even getting up into the 70s. And, um, and so typically when there is a level of high irritability in somebody maybe that isn't um, accustomed to high level exercise or anything like that, we're gonna start with really, really low level loading stuff type stuff. So simple, simple stuff like this is so simple, right? To just actively abduct in this kind of, sort of without resistance, this sort of, you know, weight weightless environment kind of just sliding the heel along the table like that and then of course you can always add resistance manual resistance i could have resistance from a band i like this band out on the forefoot like this because that's going to engage the external rotators of the hip a little bit more which is which is super valuable so if i had that band down around the ankle around the knees or something like that i wouldn't get that external rotation moment like i get when i put it out there towards the foot like that so that little looped around the forefoot is, is nice for that one. Working glute max and one of the challenges we have with a relatively low level exercise like a bridge is typically these, these patients will get some type of cramp through the hamstring or they'll feel like their hamstring is kind of controlling the movement and get like kind of that Charlie horse feeling. I don't want that. I really want the glutes to, to really be the primary activator and really generate that hip extension movement. And so one of the ways that you can do that is by bringing the feet together, knees out wide, and then raise up and push through the glutes like that. So that reduces the EMG activation of the hamstrings. 
you're going to get a stronger glute contraction, a little bit less of a hamstring con contraction. The further you abduct, the better. That's been looked at at a couple different angles of abduction. You can abduct nice and wide with the feet together, even adding resistance like you have here, and move into that hip extension movement. Good. Don't don't downplay the the importance of a good quality bridge. It seems like a basic, simple exercise, but uh, doing this, you know, with with some specificity, I think has value. Making sure that the height is sufficient. I'd like to see the pelvis get up in a straight line between the knee. The hip, when he comes up into full extension here, the straight line from the knee to the hip to the shoulder, right? So that's good height for, for a bridge right there. Knee, hip, shoulder alignment. A lot of people won't do that. They won't be able to get up quite as far because of pain or just because they're unable to perform that movement. You can assist them up, give them a little assistance to kind of raise up because quantity of movement for, for that one is important. Simple stuff like the clam. This is a nice hip rotator exercise. So I'm working external rotation of the hip i'm having him kind of slide his top leg forward a little bit you see that sort of push forward with his femur on his top leg and then abduct and externally rotate like that so it's a really nice hip external rotator movement and he's not compensating by rolling his pelvis or his spine back because he's jutting that top leg forward there try that one on your own you feel uh, it's it's a it's a much stronger burn much more intense exercise when you add that protrusion of that top femur forward like that, you really get a nice, nice fatigue to that glute need. Standing, actively abducting, especially when there's some type of balance impairment, or I just feel like we're not quite ready to walk across the room and do sidestepping type movements, just standing in place, even with your hands supported on something. Again, I love that band around the foot there. I'm getting hip external rotator control. So remember, we're treating this just like we are the rotator cuff, not worried so much about straight plane abduction. We want quite a bit of external rotation control as well. And then some type of weight bearing loading. And, and you, you know, sky's the limit here. You can do quite a bit with this, but standing on one leg, sort of jutting that, that pelvis upward by, in this case, she's getting a little bit of knee flexion, extending the knee, extending the hip, and then trying to kind of raise that opposite ilium upward to try to control, in this case, the right side glute need. Some more straight plane abduction work, but we know one of the big impairments with these patients is that that tendon starts to break down. You start seeing a Trendelenburg gait, so you really want to get weight-bearing control, uh, some type of a step-up exercise like that's valuable for that. And then I, I'm a big fan of that, you know, getting that hip hinge. And this is too much for some people. For some people, we don't quite get here necessarily. But uh, for a lot of patients, you do want this balance training from the single leg. I want this disassociation between the hip and, and the knee and the spine. I want to try to create a nice hip hinge, teach a nice hip hinge. And glute med is having to control. I'm getting glute med, glute min, isometric control, keeping that hip, that pelvis in neutral while he hinges over. Nice eccentric control of glute max and then concentrically bringing it back up like that. So it's a, another good one for that weight bearing carryover. Last one, walking lunge. So I, I think with a lot of these, what you'll find is when you load them through a range, particularly multi-joint and even eccentric range, that tends to provoke symptoms. So I wanna see them get to a point where stuff like this isn't painful, where they're able to lunge and reach forward. You think about glute max being in that full stretch position the posterior fibers of glute me being in a nice stretch position when i get to that bottom of the eccentric movement of that lunge like that so that's a great exercise obviously from a balance standpoint from a cardiovascular standpoint and then from a hip control standpoint just a great all all around exercise and you could you could you know certainly advance all of these well past that but i wanted to give you a couple ideas of sort of just some relatively low level progressions of the hip tendon and and think of that like a a cuff tendinopathy and treat it that way as opposed to greater trochanteric bursitis i think oftentimes maybe i think that the bursa is swollen it looks swollen and that is not it at all it's just thickening in that area it's just adipose tissue and, it, and it's um you're just you're mistaken in in thinking that the bursa is swollen maybe and and i'm not saying that happens all the time but i'm just saying i think most of the time it's probably more of 
tenonosis that responds well to a loading progression than a bursa that needs to necessarily be uh, calmed down or the, the swelling needs to be removed from it or something like that. So hopefully that helps us give you a little different perspective. Uh, I teach the extremity management course. We are in Minneapolis, Minnesota in two weeks, not this weekend, the weekend after. And then we got a couple places you can catch us in the month of October, be in Philadelphia, uh, and then also Marquette, Michigan, both in, in October. So catch us. I got uh, my buddy Dan Dallator will be with me at, at a couple of those, as well as Con Cabra, who's going to be helping us out um, at the Minneapolis course as well. So look forward to seeing you guys soon. Have a great day, everybody.